Hello everyone, I'm David W. Palmer and I'm bringing part 10 of a prophetic word for May 2020 and beyond. If you haven't seen the previous parts, please go back on YouTube or you can find them on Facebook and look at them because it's strategically important. God's been downloading to me a revelation from the story of really Passover to Pentecost and into the promised land about the changes that God is bringing now. We're certainly in a transition season and we're getting ready to enter the promised land of being the glorious church and taking control of many things that we've never had control of before. But in this part of the story, we're talking about leadership change, change of leaders and the different levels that people stayed at in their pursuit of God. And of course, in a previous one, we've looked at the different types of prophetic ministries so there were prophets of fear and unbelief who actually were given the same revelation by God of the promised land, but their fear and their unbelief and the way they spread it among their people listening to their message prevented them from going in. And they, of course, wandered then for 40 years. Only 20% of the prophets in their day actually brought a word that was from God, full of faith, full of boldness and courage and were ready to go to the promised land. However, even in the wilderness, they still had an amazing journey. They had a great leader in Moses, Moses who had demonstrated signs and wonders. He'd gone onto the mountain and met with God. He organized the building of the tabernacle. God met with him face to face. He was a great leader. He quelled riots and he pulled down all the um, misbehavior by the people. He kept them in line with the word of God. Moses was a great leader. However, Moses could not. I'm going to repeat that again in a minute. Moses, who represents the law, who represents really even spirit-led and spirit-filled leadership. Moses, who had done signs and wonders. Moses, who had extracted them from Egypt, could not take them into the promised land. And I'll read the reason in a minute. But Moses had to, or God had to change from Moses to Joshua, a new leader to take them into the promised land. And this is extremely important. Let's read what the Bible says about Moses. This is from Deuteronomy 34, verses 10 to 12. And it says, There has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And remember, he could not take them in. The Lord sent him to perform all the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts, listen to the wording, in the sight of Israel. Terrifying acts for the Egyptians. He brought them out of Egypt, but these, the miracles were done in the sight of of Israel. In other words, Israel saw them, but they didn't participate in them. They saw their leader doing it and they knew God was real and they probably even applauded him and thought this is amazing, but they didn't participate. Now in the new season, God wants to do amazing things through you. And then, of course, the world can be the ones we do it in their sight. They can watch. Why was Moses rejected by God from being the leader to take them into the promised land? And the key is found in this story in Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 to 12. God said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. The, people, the background was that there was no water for everyone in the wilderness and God wanted to provide miraculously. So he told them, assemble the entire community, take the staff, as the people watch, again, they're just watching. God told Moses, speak to the rock over there. Of course, from our perspective, the rock represents Jesus. Speak to the rock and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told, some of it. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord then he and Aaron summoned the people to come together at the rock. Now, listen to what Moses said. Remember, Moses is the law personified. He said, listen, you rebels. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. 
Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. The entire community and their livestock drank their fill. Verse 12, this is Numbers 20, verse 12. But, now that word changes everything. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel. What didn't he do? He didn't demonstrate God's holiness. From our perspective, in one sense, he didn't confess God's word. He didn't obey God's illogical instruction. He didn't do what God said to do. He didn't speak what God said to speak. He struck the rock instead of speaking to it. So he didn't demonstrate God's holiness. Therefore, God said, you will not lead the people into the land I am giving them. This is powerful. It's prophetic. It's emphatic in a sense. And I believe that what God spoke to me is that there's going to be a change of leaders in this and the immediate new season. And we're going to see some leaders just know it's their time. They're going to move away. Some leaders are going to be put down by God and some may even be promoted to glory. But the thing is, there are only some leaders who will take the children of God through the river into the promised land. So after Moses' death, of course, Moses' death well, was interesting. He went up on top of the mountain and possibly went up like Elijah did because we know that he came back down onto the man of transfiguration with Elijah talking to Jesus later on. Then after the month or so of mourning for Moses, because he was a great leader. As I read, there was no prophet risen like him. But after Moses, Joshua took over and there was a transference of anointing, a transference of mantle, of leadership to Joshua, who of course had been Moses' servant for a long time. And it even said that when Moses had finished speaking with God, you know, he spoke to God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. God said, I'll speak to you between the above the mercy seat and between the wings of the cherubim from the Ark of the Covenant in the holy place in the tabernacle. Afterwards, it says Joshua would stay in there. He was embalmed in the glory of God. He was imbibing it, you could say. But this is what happened next. Numbers 32, 1 to 2, then verses 4 and 5, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. This is another kind of leader. i give you a hint. This is a leader that had been very successful in the previous season. Now, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of livestock or flocks. They had big flocks. And when they saw the land of Jazza and the land of Gilead, that indeed the region was a place for livestock. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came to Moses and spoke to him, to Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the congregation saying, now this is what they said. And it speaks to me of a style of leadership that we have to be aware of. And you may even be challenged to be this leader or not challenged, tempted, I should say. This is what they said. The country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock and your servants have livestock. Therefore, they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Listen to this. I'll, I'll give you the verse again. This is Numbers 32 verse 5. Do not take us over Jordan. This is a disaster. And I'll try somehow to illustrate what I believe this is saying prophetically. So some leaders, now we're, we're talking about leaders here. Leaders have been successful in the current season or the old season, the season of wilderness. Their flocks had multiplied. They'd been successful at building flocks. They'd been successful at um, growing their family and their numbers. And when they got close to the river, they saw that the grass was green because it's close to the river. And they wanted to stay there. And, and it's amazing what they negotiated with Moses. They said, how about this? How about this? We'll stay on this side of the river. We will build fortified cities for our people because there's lots of inhabitants still in the land. 
Now, they weren't in the wilderness. They weren't in, and I'll come back to the wilderness in a minute. They weren't in Egypt. But like Egypt, they were still surrounded by the world system who had control of much of it. So they just built themselves fortified cities so they would be in there. They could be together. They could be protected. They had large flocks. They built sheepfolds for their flocks. In other words, these were like leaders. And please hear me. I would never criticize a church. The church is Jesus' bride. And I certainly don't want anyone speaking against my bride. And I know that Jesus doesn't want anyone speaking against his bride, but I feel I've been sitting on this word for a week because I wasn't sure about whether I should bring it because I know it can be so misunderstood so easily. But God is just telling us to be aware. I know that 80% of the prophets were the prophets of unbelief and doubt, but this is only, well, probably less than 20% of the leaders and the leaders of flocks and the leaders of herds. They wanted to build huge sheepfolds and it was like they had enjoyed the success of the previous season and they got halfway to the promised land, saw that it could really work under the old system, so they wanted to use the newfound life and power for the old system, but this is what they didn't do. They didn't lead their people into and through the river following the Ark of the Covenant. So the background story is this. When they finally got to the brink of the promised land, jo Joshua took over as leader. And I'll go through some of this in the next message or in the next video. And Joshua ended up giving them this promise. He said, the Ark of the Covenant or of the God of the whole world will go before you and you will follow it. And when the priests put their feet in the river, the river will stop flowing it will bank up and the king james says hither and thither and then you will go across on dry land to the other side and then they all assembled over there and the point is what is the river the river is the jordan river and it means flow or descend it means flow from above and prophetically it's speaking to us of the river of life that flows out from the throne of god and it throws into the heart of everybody that's born again, that's in tune with Jesus and listening. There's a lot to say about this, but the Ark of the Covenant was there and the Ark represents God's glorious presence. This is the place where God spoke to Moses. And I believe that prophetically as they cross the river, it's the place where God speaks to everyone. Everyone can hear the voice of God. This is the purpose of of the New Testament. This is the reason Jesus died. Not so that there could be someone else, not even a prophet, telling you what you should do or speaking to you on God's instead of God. It's only the New Testament prophet is only there to confirm what God is saying, not to take his place. That would be putting us back under the old covenant. And we certainly don't want to go there because, you know, as I said, the law personified could not take them in there. And so the children of Israel, most of them crossed the river and the river is the only way into the promised land. There is no other way in there. You have to go into the river of God. You have to be in a place of hearing God's voice, manifest God's glory and be there and know what he's saying to you. This is the way in. I'm going to speak a lot more about how to enter the promised land in the next message. So what happened? These leaders then negotiated with Moses and the leaders of Gad and the leaders of Reuben. And they said, all right, we'll leave our people, our flock in their new sheepfolds where there's lots of green grass. We'll put them in fortified cities so the world can't affect them. We'll make sure they're protected. We'll even come across the river with you. We will help you get your inheritance. We'll even fight for you over there but we will not lead our people there. And when we get finished, we're coming back on this side of the river and we're going to settle near it. And I want to encourage you today, don't be the kind of leader or don't come under the kind of leader that doesn't want to go across the river, through the river, 
keeping with the ark. They let the ark get away because they had their opportunity to build something fortified, something wonderful for them and to keep their group together and not let anybody else hear the voice of God. You could say just them, but there was plenty of green grass because they were near the river. They were near where the rain was pouring out in the promised land. So what can we say? Don't be like them. Don't stay on the wrong side of the river. You can have huge flocks where you can have huge flocks, build sheepfolds, live in fortified cities, cross over with the ark and fight for your inheritance. A lot of people don't want to cross the river. They don't even want to go into the river. They don't want to get to the other side where they have to fight. But there's a key to it coming up. Okay, so what I'm saying in this message is that there are four levels. And I want you to think about this very carefully. You may be familiar with these stories, but this is what God is saying to us right now. First level is Egypt. And now we're not talking about the Egyptians who represent the world system in this story. Actually, Egyptians are nice people. and We have Egyptian friends and they're wonderful people. But in this story, it's a picture of the world system. And Moses had to demonstrate a mighty and forceful hand to get the people extricated from there. But they were God's people living in there. And, you know, they had food. They were using the world system without even realizing how much they were enslaved to it. And they were there and, you know, and they existed. Then Moses took them into the wilderness. Now, I know in the wilderness, some of them wanted to go back to the world system. But in the wilderness, think about this, the wilderness. You can imagine someone up getting up and giving a testimony about their wilderness church. Only they're not telling you it's the wilderness. It sounds like this. Oh, our church is great. We have the glory of God manifested all the time. We have a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud, sorry, by day, pillar of fire by night. Our leader's a great leader. He meets with God. As a matter of fact, his face shone. He hears from God. He's been on a 40-day fast with God. He's a great leader. He sorts out all of our problems. When we're hungry, he provides food. As a matter of fact, we've had 40 years in our church where we've had supernatural provision. We've had water even coming out of rocks. We've had quails when we got hungry. Our shoes didn't wear out. Our clothes didn't wear out. We've got plenty of money because when we left Egypt, God made them pay us all their back pay. We've got plenty of money. We've even built a great tabernacle here. This is a great church. It sounds good, but I've got to repeat this. This is wilderness. Do not stay in the wilderness. Do not lead your people in the wilderness and leave them there. It might seem good, but it's not God's objective. And we know that God is good and we know that God provides. And the Bible says he provides seed for the sower. But we want to get a harvest. Amen. We don't want to just see in the wilderness. It was great. They never got attacked by any enemy. Very rarely did they have to fight. No one was battling them for the possession of the wilderness. Why? Because it's not an inheritance. It wasn't worth fighting for. Nobody else wanted it. Amen. They were there happy, clappy. They could sing along. They could do everything. They could live in their tents. They could move when they had to. That possibly a real sense of achievement. We all move somewhere. Woohoo! And now we've got fire. And now we've got pillar. Our leaders hearing from God. OK, so that's the second level. The wilderness. Don't stay there. Then there's the Reuben and Gad leaders. As I said, they want to stay on the green side of the river. They want to stay there. They want to leave their flocks there. They'll even cross to help sometimes. But then they come back and they got their flocks in the sheepfold. They're all living in fortified cities. The world's all around them. But as long as they're happy on the inside, got plenty of green grass. Everybody's growing and happy. They were happy. But they, if you want your promised land, you have to stick with the ark of God where God will speak to you. And there's only one access through the river. Amen. And then, of course, when they got over the river, they had to deal with their flesh. Then they had to fight. Nobody likes fighting. But remember, without Goliath, David is just a shepherd boy. We have to fight enemies. And once we go over the river, we start then to inherit. And eventually, to cut a long story short, they not only inherited the land, they not only had the world living around them, they pushed the world out. Out the whole world system, they pushed it out of their inheritance. They ran the government. Here we go. They ran the media. 
they ran the property. There were other people from other nations living there, but they made them, they wouldn't even let them in the army at times. They made them into water carriers and stone cutters and things like that. But the people of God, you could say in the current sort of environment, they had the top of the seven mountains. They organized everything. They were autonomous in the nation. They weren't just autonomous in their sheepfold or even in their fortified city. They were autonomous in the nation. They ran everything. They owned everything. And that's what God is saying to you. Your inheritance, your promised land is when you get out there and take property, when you get out there and become the leaders in the world system, when you start to dispossess the squatters from what God has promised you. And there is a lot of things he's promised. I don't have time to talk about it right now, but let's pray. Father, as we look at this prophetic word, we're praying and asking that you would bring conviction by your Holy Spirit. Open the eyes of our understanding that we could see, first of all, what kind of a leader we are and what our objectives are as a leader and also to understand the leaders that you, we are under. And Father, we know that in this time some leadership will change and that we know that it's only a minority of the leaders who won't go across but Father, we are praying right now for every one of us who hears this message that you would fix it in our hearts that whatever it takes, we're going to leave living in Egypt. We're going to leave living in the wilderness. We're going to even leave living in Gilead and we're going to cross the river into the promised land. No matter how much fighting we have to do, no matter how much flesh we have to deal with, but we will move forward until we possess what Jesus died for us to possess in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening. I'll see you in the next video. God bless you.